Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to this guide to latency. Latency is one of those subjects that is pretty easy to understand the fundamental concepts and really difficult to truly understand what's actually going on. So in the course of this mini series, I'm going to try to break down some of the myths and mysteries surrounding the subject so that you can really understand what you're doing and how you're interacting with latency when you're recording your music. If you enjoy the series, please check out the Patreon or YouTube channel member links below or some way to help support my channel. Okay, let's deal with some general definitions. When we head into the studio setup screen, we see the control panel, and this is where we configure our audio interface. The most important setting that we have to configure when we're dealing with latency is the buffer size. This is in the audio interface itself. This is the interface for my Focusrite 18i8. And you can see that at the moment I have a buffer size of 64 samples. That number is basically a contract between the audio interface and your computer, whereby the audio interface guarantees that it will allow a period of grace, in this case 4.014 milliseconds, for the computer to basically fall behind in which it's allowed to catch up again. And the thing that it's falling behind or catching up again is the delivery of samples or the collection of samples to or from the audio interface. So let's deal with the audio interface collecting samples. So the computer is sending information to the audio interface. I have a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which means that 44,100 times a second, the audio interface says to the computer, give me that sample right now. It's absolutely military precise and it's completely uncompromising in its demand for that sample. If we had no buffer and the connection between the computer and the audio interface was complete and pure, the computer would have to be ready with that sample every single time. And if it misses delivery, the, the audio interface is going to process a zero. It's not gonna wait, it can't stretch time and so you're going to hear clicks and pops and crackles and all of the nonsense we hear when we have audio dropouts. That's too much. That's too much demand to place on the computer. It can't guarantee that it's going to be ready to deliver that sound, that, that single sample, uh, every time the audio interface demands it. And so it gets given this headroom. It's basically, it's like a queue where the audio interface says, instead of you communicating directly with me and me taking one sample off you and processing it immediately, I'll give you this buffer where you can fill 64 different samples in this queue and I will always process the, 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 the next one out, first in, first out. I will also guarantee that the moment you start doing something, I'm going to wait 4.014 milliseconds before processing that information. In other words, the audio interface is always going to be slightly behind time. That's the headroom that the PC is being given in order to be able to deliver these samples in a timely fashion. It doesn't particularly matter how that buffer's processed, whether or not it can shrink or expand over the course of time in terms of the number of samples available for the, for the audio interface to, to process. We don't care about the internal mechanisms of the buffer. It's simply a contract between the audio interface and the computer to say, I'm going to wait this long, don't worry, if you fall slightly behind in the meantime, as long as you catch up, we're all gonna be good. It's exactly the same with delivery from the audio interface. If it's sending sound into the computer, similarly, the computer has to be ready to collect that piece of information or it'll be lost. The audio interface won't store it. And again, it gives the computer this 64 samples worth of headroom to say, well, don't worry about it right now. I'll put this message in a queue and you pick it up when you're ready. That 4.014 milliseconds, it, and this is just my computer, this is the, the number on my computer with this audio interface at this, at this buffer size. That's a fixed amount. And the thing is that Cubase knows what that number is. And the effect of that knowledge is that Cubase is gonna be able to account for it. And this is real, one of the really important things to bear in mind with buffers. Don't think that you have to delay or offset your recordings by any amount at all, you don't. Cubase is gonna take care of this stage of the process for us, and I'll prove that now. So what we've got is an audio file. This is a click track that I recorded, and it's basically beat perfect. So if we drill in, we can see that the click starts at exactly the beat. 
this audio is going to be output to my uh, audio device and I have a, a physical loopback cables coming out of my audio device out of outputs three and four and then these physical analog cables come back into the device into a pair of inputs that we call loopback in. On this second track down here called click loopback you can see that the input for this track is loopback in and it's got no output, it's not outputting this information anywhere. So when I press record, the audio on the original click track is gonna be output to the audio interface, physically travel along analog ports out of the box, back into the audio device, get processed by the uh, analog to digital converter and sent into Cubase. Both of those processes, the output and the input, are gonna have four millisecond delays but watch what happens to the recorded signals. If I drill right into these samples, you can see there is a tiny offset. And if I switch to samples view in the info bar, you can see that there's a seven sample offset between those two audio signals. Now seven samples is absolutely microscopic. If we were dealing with a four millisecond input uh, latency and a four millisecond output latency, eight milliseconds at 44.1 samples per millisecond is over 300 samples. So theoretically, there should be a lag between these two signals of 300 samples, and there isn't. There's seven. That's because Cubase is taking care of all of those numbers internally. It knows what that reported latency is on my audio device and it's automatically compensated. This click loopback track that's just been recorded has been recorded with that latency taken into account. You don't have to do it manually. If you're wondering where those seven samples um, are coming from, that's simply inherent system latency. The, that reported number might be slightly inaccurate. There might be slight inaccuracies in the USB bus, for instance, that the PC is using. There are buses all over the place. The fact is that seven samples is an absolutely microscopic, completely unnoticeable um, discrepancy, and it's got nothing to do with the size of the buffer. As it happens later on in this series, I'll show you how to get rid of even that tiny um, discrepancy, but we're not gonna worry about that today. Just to really put a nail in this argument, I'm gonna change the buffer size and do the recording again. I'm gonna set my focus right to a buffer size of 1024. Now, when I click this, it's gonna be really difficult for me to talk to you because I'm, listening, I'm hearing my own microphone signal uh, through software monitoring inside Cubase. And so there's gonna be about a, um, a tenth of a second delay between me talking to you and me hearing that signal back. It makes it really, really hard to do. But anyway, here we go. I'm quite deliberately avoiding talking to you because the delay is so difficult to manage. Okay, now we can zoom in to these tracks and we can see that there's an absolutely tiny difference between these two signals. We're now dealing with eight samples. So I've set the buffer to, um, to 1024 samples, which gives the PC a massive amount of headroom. Uh, the latency value, both input and output, is something like 47 milliseconds there. So, so almost a tenth of a second lag in between this signal physically going out to the audio uh, of the audio interface ports and then back into the, the device and ultimately onto the computer. All of that lag is not seen in Cubase. It knows how big the delay is and it compensates for it. So that's a really important thing to get your head around when you're first trying to understand what buffering is and where all of these latencies are coming from. It's nothing to do with the physical recording process. That's taken care of. The problem is in the live playing because it becomes really, really difficult to actually play or record live if there's a big lag. So rather than just talking about it, let's do it. And I'll actually use the microphone. This is a perfectly good um, audio input device to use. I could use my guitar or the keyboard, but I've got a microphone here, so we're gonna use that. And we're gonna basically do some testing, timing tests with the microphone to see this lag in operation. 
What I'm going to do for this test is I've set up a couple of tracks here. I've got my vocal uh, track that's taking an input with the from the main microphone. And you can see that that's, that's heading off to um, a master bus. That master bus is ultimately getting itself to the outside world. You don't particularly need to worry about the routing, but it's going to the audio interface. That's the important thing. What I'm then going to do is take that signal out of the audio interface. And this is a mono signal, so I'll come back in on the loopback left. And I don't want any output on this track because otherwise I'd end up with feedback. So I'm going to talk on the microphone, it's going to get recorded on this track and a second copy is going to come out of the audio interface back in again and get recorded on the loopback track. I've got a very small buffer here, my 64 sample buffer is very small and so I'm pretty much live as I'm talking to you I'm hearing the results. And What I'll do is I'll click as if I'm a metronome and I'll try to play as accurately as I can. A couple of them were better than others, but never mind, it's good enough. And there you can see the natural inaccuracy of a live performance. This last beat was really pretty good. I was very, very close, I was very slightly ahead of time, but that is uh, an extremely small range. How many samples was I out there? I was only out by seven samples, so that fourth beat, I got it pretty much spot on. But look at the difference. You can also see that I've recorded the click here. So that's that square wave there that you're seeing is the click track. But the difference between my original recording getting recorded more or less perfect in Cubase, smack on the beat, and then the version going all the way out to the output bus and back into the input bus is the difference between these two peaks. Have a look at that number, 360 samples. Now we can figure out what that number means by having a look at the latencies again. Here we've got our input and output latency at 4.014 milliseconds and we know that the sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz. So this second signal, the loopback signal, has passed through both of those buffers. Well at 360 samples at 44.1 kilohertz, that round trip is approximately 8.16 milliseconds. Since the input and the output buffers both have a similar latency, we can divide that by two to see it's really close. 4.08 milliseconds was the actual determined latency and the reported latency out of the audio interface is 4.014. So very, very close. That's the reason why those two recordings are that far apart. If I make that buffer bigger, if I now go up to 1,024 samples, it's going to be incredibly difficult for me to keep anywhere near accurate time. Because the click that I make with my fingers is going to be reflected back to my ears about a tenth of a second later. And that makes it really, really hard to keep time. But let's have a go. Okay, not bad. Oh, I'll just get rid of the um, the lag. And now we can see the physical difference between those recordings by looking at the difference in the sample size. Again, this is the click that you're seeing over here, the recorded click. So the gap between recordings is now 4,227. divided by two to account for the two different buffers. 47.778 milliseconds, <laughs> there's this lag, and 47.92 was the actual recorded value. You can see with the original recording, I had the counting to kind of get me ready so that when I clicked the timings, I was really just basically going from muscle memory, having reminded myself what the timing was. And I got them more or less right with no help from my ears. I had to ignore my ears. Even so, I almost immediately start falling out of time. Uh, I was 776 samples 
um, out in that particular instance. A very small amount in real terms, but nevertheless, that's because my timing just didn't have any anchor upon which to sit. What I was hearing wasn't what wasn't the same as what I was performing. So we've got two different things at play here. The audible lag is what makes it so difficult to play a musical instrument when we have our latency too big. But then in addition, if we're also sending those signals out of audio interfaces and back in again, we're going to end up with this um, with this physical lag in the actual recorded track. So all of this is stuff we need to be aware of. And in the remaining episodes of this series, we'll see all the various features that Cubase gives us to basically mitigate this problem down to the minimum possible level, but also to be able to reduce as much burden as possible from the computer in terms of its CPU requirements when it's actually processing a fully laden project. Hope you enjoyed this one. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks very much.